Hi, Dr. Kat Vlies here from Central New Mexico Community College. Video K on the endocrine system will focus here on the adrenal glands. Once we're done with the adrenal glands, we'll look at our last gland, the pancreas. So this is our second to last video. The adrenal glands sit like little hats on top of our kidneys. Um, as a matter of fact, they're often also referred to as the suprarenal glands which literally means, of course, little glands sitting superior to the kidneys. They're protected by a nice fibrous capsule, and then they're made up of two layers that are pretty distinct looking. One is called the cortex, and the inner layer is called the medulla, layer names that you're very familiar with by now. Remember, we've learned plenty about the adrenal medulla secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine, especially in the cardiovascular system, actually throughout the, the various organ systems that we've studied. We call these hormones collectively catecholamines. And also recall that the medulla is really a bunch of modified postganglionic sympathetic fibers. And if, if you've forgotten about that, I'll re-explain that in just a moment. The cortex is all typical glandular epithelial tissue, and it secretes a bunch of steroids. And again, since these are steroids being secreted by the cortex of our adrenal gland, we call them cortico for cortex steroids. Let's come back for a moment to the adrenal medulla, which is modified nervous tissue, particularly sympathetic nervous tissue. You might recall that all the preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system always arise from the spinal cord. So I'm just going to sketch this real quick. So here's the cell body in either the thoracic or in the lumbar area of the spinal cord um, of a sympathetic neuron that is going to reach out to then synapse with another uh, sympathetic neuron, which we typically call the postganglionic sympathetic neuron. And of course, your parasympathetic nervous system is laid out this way as well, but it has origins in different parts of the spinal cord and even the brainstem. You know that by now. So we refer to this one as the preganglionic neuron, and this one is your postganglionic neuron. And typically, these postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system are going to secrete norepinephrine. There's a few exceptions, but typically it is norepinephrine. Now, in some <clears throat> locations, we see that these preganglionic fibers are actually going to synapse with the interior of our adrenal gland. And there we see that these postganglionic neurons are actually these modified cells inside of the medulla. And there they're going to secrete not just epinephrine, oops, epinephrine, but also norepinephrine. Now this arrangement of, or, or this combination, I should say, in a gland of both nervous tissue and epithelial tissue, we've seen before. We've seen this being the case in the pituitary gland as well. So it's a pretty unusual situation. Really, your adrenal gland and the pituitary gland are the only examples of glands that are not just made up of epithelial tissue, but also made up of some nervous tissue. So keep that in mind. Let's now take a, a quick peek at the histology of the adrenal gland. We're not going to go into great detail here. That's something more for a lab. <clears throat> but again, we see the adrenal medulla here in near the bottom of this picture. On a slide, it would typically stain a, a very different color. Often it's quite reddish, that area. Remember, your adrenal medulla produces epinephrine and norepinephrine, and we'll see why they're referred to as stress hormones very often. So the remainder of the slide right here represents the cortex, and there are three distinct areas in the cortex referred to as most superficially the zona glomerulosa, 
followed by the zona fasciculata, and sitting closest to the medulla, the zona reticularis. The zona glomerulosa, glomerulosa, you hear the term glomerular in there. We've seen that before in the kidneys, which always refers to literally a ball of yarn. So in this area, again, not the greatest slide, but you can sort of see it here particularly. The cells are arranged in little clumps and little balls, and from there that term, the zona glomerulosa. This is the region of the cortex that produces a group of hormones referred to as the mineralocorticoids. And the one that is the most common and the one that we've already learned a lot about is aldosterone. The middle zone, we call them zona fasciculata. Fasciculus typically refers to uh, strands of cells. And this is the region or the zone that produces the so-called so glucocorticoids, which regulate glucose levels in the blood, along with uh, insulin and glucagon, as we'll see here in, in a little bit. And so the more common hormone um, that you, I think I should say you've heard about is cortisol and its derivatives such as cortisone and corticosterone. You're most familiar with cortisol and, and we'll probably typically refer to it as such. And then finally the zona reticularis produces androgens, meaning male sex hormones. And the one to point out is called D hydroepiandrosterone, um, abbreviated, and you have probably seen this as a supplement on the market, DHEA. This is a hormone that can be converted into testosterone and even estrogen. So here we see that not only do our gonads produce um, these hormones, male versus female, um, but our adrenal gland, particularly the cortex as well. So we, we have two sources for the production of our sex hormones. So something to keep in mind. Clearly the adrenal medulla is regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. Those sympathetic preganglionic fibers are going to trigger or not trigger the release of norepinephrine and epinephrine in the bloodstream. What about those steroids produced by the cortex of the adrenal gland called the corticosteroids? And remember, they include cortisol and, and its der derivatives, the, the so-called glucocorticoids, the mineralocorticoids to which aldosterone belongs, and then the estrogens that um, can be converted into testosterone. Well, the hypothalamus is going to release corticotropin releasing factor or releasing hormone, CRF or CRH, let's add that, <clears throat> which then communicates with the anterior pituitary through the portal system, that um, blood portal system, which then triggers the just the right cells in the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH which stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. Long name, but it gives you all the information you need. Adreno for the adrenal gland, cortico for the cortex of the adrenal gland, tropic implying that this is a hormone that will trigger the release of other hormones from this gland. And of course, if on the other hand, the hypothalamus is not releasing this releasing hormone, we're not going to see uh, these hormones released by the adrenal glands. Notice that stress in particular is going to trigger the hypothalamus to release CRH. Talking about stress, the adrenal glands are very much involved in responses to stressful situations. And we could have a long discussion about stress. I've just kept it short to a couple of slides here. And we're just going to look at the two most extreme 
forms of stress, and that is short-term stress, which triggers your fight-or-flight response. You have to perhaps um, avoid a car hitting you as you're crossing the street or you're camping and a bear is approaching you. You know by now that that triggers your sympathetic nervous system and that, of course, releases norepinephrine by means of the postganglionic fibers and in the case of the adrenal medulla, also norep norepinephrine and uh, epinephrine. And don't forget, these two hormones are also called noradrenaline and adrenaline. You can use those terms very much interchangeably. Now, if we are under persistent long-term stress, as we all know, not a very healthy situation, then your typical fight-or-flight res response with the help of the sympathetic nervous system is not going to play as much of a role and instead, our adrenal cortex, so not the medulla anymore, which plays a role in short-term stress, but the, the cortex is now going to start secreting its glucocorticoids, cortisol in particular. Now, this has its benefits in some ways, as we'll see here in a moment, but some of the not-so-great results of the release of cortisol for a lengthy period of time is that it can lead to depression, also immune suppression, so we become more immunocompromised, severe fatigue, and it can also lead to heart attacks. By the way, often people have heart attacks early in the morning, shortly after they rise, because that's when our cortisol levels tend to uh, rise in the blood. Let's use this flowchart to compare the effects of short-term stress with long-term stress. So let's say that you're suddenly needing to avoid being hit by a car. Your brain will then send action potentials towards the spinal cord, particularly the thoracolumbar region of the spinal cord, where our sympathetic nervous system originates. And if we're just focusing on the adrenal gland here, then the preganglionic sympathetic fibers will synapse with the medulla cells of the uh, adrenal gland, which then in turn will dump epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. Keep in mind, as a little side note, that some preganglionic fibers will synapse with your regular postganglionic uh, sympathetic fibers that will then be triggered to release just norepinephrine. At any rate, when one or both of these hormones are into, entered into, into the bloodstream, we're going to see, as you know by now, that that's going to increase our heart rate as, as well as our blood pressure. If our heart rate goes up, typically our blood pressure goes up. And we see that our metabolic rate is going to increase as well. The liver is going to start releasing glucose by going through the process of glycogenolysis. Remember, that's the splitting of glycogen. We need that glucose because we may have to run and we therefore need that kind of energy. We're going to have to be able to breathe better, so we see bronchodilation. Remember that your parasympathetic nervous, I'm sorry, your sympathetic nervous system is going to promote the relaxation of the bronchioles so that we uh, can breathe better. And let's not forget that all of our organs that really need to kick in during a time of stress need to have plenty of blood with nutrients and oxygen. So blood is diverted towards our heart, our brain, and certainly our skeletal muscles. Um, our brain needs it to be uh, more alert. Our special senses really, really need to be very acute. And clearly, we're not going to be needing to digest our food or create urine at this point in time. So that's your neural pathway and your hormonal response um, for short-term stress. Let's take a look at long-term chronic stress. So in this case, the nuclei that you learned about in the hypothalamus are going to release corticotropin corticotropin releasing hormone into the portal system, in the hypophysial portal system, which then triggers, or this hormone then binds to receptors on specific cells in the anterior pituitary, which are then uh, triggered to release 
adrenocorticotropic hormone, it enters into the bloodstream, it finds its receptors on cells located in the cortex of the adrenal gland. The cortex, of course, secretes three different sets of hormones, but the two groups of hormones that are going to be playing an important role in long-term stress are the mineralocorticoids, and recall that is going to be primarily aldosterone, as well as the corticosteroids, which of course is primarily going to be cortisol and its der derivatives. You know by now that aldosterone is going to promote sodium reabsorption, and if water can follow, then it will, and that's going to increase our blood volume, and if that increases our blood volume, we're also going to see that our blood pressure is going to co go up. So we see sort of a, a similar response as we saw in our short-term stress, um, except that we're depending on a hormone here. The cortisol and its derivatives are going to allow for the formation of new glucose molecules from um, amino acids, perhaps even lipids. Remember, we call that gluconeogenesis. And unfortunately, one of the main negative side effects of the release of cortisol in the bloodstream for a lengthy time period is that we become immunocompromised. Here then you see a text slide basically reiterating what I just uh, covered with you on the previous slide of the flowchart. But just a couple more things to point out here. Epinephrine and norepinephrine we do not need. Uh, to survive. So they're not essential for life. Don't forget the associations between an increased heart rate and cardiac output and an increased heart rate and an increase in blood pressure, therefore. The reason for why our blood can be redistributed to some of the vital organs is because these two hormones are good vasoconstrictors and of course that impacts our peripheral resistance and you know what consequences that has. Finally, these, the responses of these hormones are rather brief, right? This is for short-term stress compared to the corticosteroids that are released during long-term stress. So those are some things for you to remember that is epinephrine and norepinephrine are not essential for life and their responses are quite brief. On the other hand, the glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, are absolutely essential for survival. We cannot live without them. They're very important in maintaining our sugar levels, particularly in between meals. And the other important thing that these hormones do during chronic times of stress is that they're going to try to maintain our blood volume by preventing the movement of water out of the blood and into our cells. As I mentioned before, cortisol levels tend to be high right after we wake up, which is why we tend to see more heart attacks early in the morning. Cortisol saves glucose in the bloodstream such that rather than using up glucose, we make more glucose from different molecules. And cortisol helps out epinephrine with its vasoconstrictive effects to promote better distribution of glucose and other nutrients. Now, I mentioned that the negative side effects of the glucocorticoids is that they make us more immunocompromised. Um, but these also are going to have anti-inflammatory effects, which is the primary reason for why people who suffer from certain diseases, particularly such things as autoimmune diseases that cause, they, ca they tend to cause a lot of inflammation. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, or lupus, and there are many autoimmune diseases that cause a lot of inflammation, they're often prescribed something called prednisone, which is actually an example of a glucocorticoid drug. So here we see how we can take advantage of the glucocorticoids being anti-inflammatory. But then again, of course, here we're treating the autoimmune disease uh, 
um, symptoms of inflammation, but then we also are going to see that these people become more and more immunocompromised. And this is a perfect example of a, a battle that many of your patients are going to have to deal with, and more than likely you in your personal life as well, when you're confronted with a disease, and sometimes a, a pretty intense disease, you have to make big decisions for your patients, sometimes for yourself, um, about should I take this medication or not? You know, you have to weigh the pros and the cons of the medication. As I said, glucocorticoids are going to treat the inflammation in patients with inflammatory diseases, but then it, it causes severe um, a severe immunocompromised situation in these patients. So discussions with patients are always very necessary to educate them about their medications and to allow them to make a decision that they're comfortable with.